godless land for a sinner's soul. All right, so I want to take a few minutes and just take a look at um, the electric guitarist's perspective. I think there's a few really important things from my angle that um, are fundamental in how I think about playing in a band situation. One of them is my pedal board setup, looking through all my effects, um, different sounds that I get from this. You know, much like an artist with their different paints, the amazing thing about playing electric guitar is we have all these different uh, sounds we can pull from to create different textures and different effects. And so I'd love to walk you through just my pedal board setup first, just to show you kind of some of the sounds I get um, and how I get them. Um, going through pretty simple pedal board setup. Um, although it maybe doesn't look that way to some of you, it's spilling over the sides. Uh, I will say you have to have a patient spouse if you're going to be an electric guitarist. A little laugh on the set. <laughs> um, but I'm going to go through my first pedal in my chain is my compressor pedal. And uh, basically this is just a very subtle effect, but it gives me a little bit of sustain on clean notes. So here's just my tone by itself. <laughs> Okay, I have the compression, and here it just adds a little bit of extra sustain at the end of those notes. Um, so a subtle thing, and some players like to have their compressor pedal on all the time as kind of a tone boost. I tend to use it a little more sparingly just to create some extra sustain when I don't want extra overdrive or distortion on. Uh, then I'm going to my volume pedal next here, which is great for a couple different purposes. One, you take it all the way back and it kills your audio altogether, which is a great tool to have. Um, but also great for doing stuff like chordal volume swells. Um, so real kind of ambient pad-like effects, volume pedal is great for that, really essential. I think one of the top pedals you should get, pre pretty cheap pedal. Um, but allows you to do a lot of those different ambient tricks um, with your guitar. And then next to my chain is my wah pedal, which a lot of people, you know, it's easy to associate the wah pedal just with funky sounds, you know. Uh, you know, with funkier type styles, but. Um, you know, you can use it in a lot of different styles of music. Here's an example of where I might use it in more of a modern rock approach. Um, this is more of a frequency sweep type effect. subtly sweeping through those frequencies, just as an example of another way to use your wah pedal. Um, and then I'm coming over to my selection of overdrive pedals, which, you know, sometime in the 40s or something, somebody cranked up a tube amp for the first time. And uh, let me just do this for you here. Turn up the volume on the amp. <laughs> you know, and all of a sudden, Somebody at some point said, man, that actually sounds pretty cool. Uh, it's a really usable sound. So, so rock and roll was born, and most of us don't have the luxury of doing that in our Sunday morning church services. I don't. Uh, so overdrive pedals allow us to get some of those more powerful, saturated sounds without having a ton of volume on our amp. Um, so for me, I like to have a few different stages of overdrive as opposed to just one pedal. I mean, good to start with one pedal. Uh, and people who are looking to get pedals, that's the first place I say to begin is with a good medium overdrive pedal. Uh, tube Screamer is a really common one. There's a lot of companies that make similar pedals to a Tube Screamer. But once you have one and you're comfortable working with that one, I like to have a couple different stages so that you don't have to be down fiddling with knobs a lot and changing levels. I can have kind of a stage one, stage two, and stage three. Um, and so let me just go through this with you. Stage one being, you know, kind of a lightly broken up. Um, sound. So you can still hear the clarity in the notes.
Okay, and even if I roll my volume pedal back, I'll turn up my volume here a little bit. It cleans up even more as I pull the volume pedal back. So that's another use of the volume pedal with the overdrive, is that you can get so many different shades of. Just based off of where you have that volume pedal. So that would be like my level one overdrive. Um, you know, just good for putting a little bit of grit on the sound, but it's not too crazy dirty. Uh, and then I go to my second stage. Which is a little thicker, a little better for um, like a rock rhythm sound, a little beefier sound. Uh, and then my third level being more of a full on uh, actual distortion. Which I would use that more for solo uh, lead boosts, unless we were doing something that was really heavy, like a you know a Hillsong United tune or something that's just um, needs more of a thick Marshall tone. That would be like my third stage. So just give myself a variety of options there to work with as far as overdrive colors. Uh, man, there's so many different types of pedals out there, different manufacturers make them. It's easy to get overwhelmed just with the options. But uh, I always tell guys just go. You go to your local music store, try a bunch of different overdrive pedals and see which ones you know you really like, see which ones inspire you to play. That's true with all these pedals, um, as it's just there's so many choices. Take the time, you know, go slow with it, start with one or two pedals and develop it more and more as you go. And just find out what song what what uh, pieces of gear inspire you to want to play more. That's really the key um, to building this setup. Um, so next in my chain, I just have an EQ pedal, which is you know real subtle. Uh, depending where we're going, at different amps backlined at different places. So that's just kind of a total, uh, subtle tone boost if I need it. Uh, then my tremolo pedal. You know, made popular on '60s Fender amps, just kind of a almost organ type Leslie speaker sound. Um, so just a cool different color you can add there. And then I've got my delay pedal. And if I'm telling people like order of effects to get, uh, I would say tuner pedal first. You've got to have a tuner pedal. Um, you know, so right here I've got my boss tuner, which is actually hooked up through my volume pedal. So when I pull back in my volume pedal, I can tune here without the whole stage hearing me, which is pretty essential. Uh, you can also hook up this pedal in a way that um, when you step on it, it mutes the signal, but I just have it routed a little bit differently here. Um, but great to be able to tune in silence here. First pedal you should get. Second pedal, a good overdrive pedal. And then the third pedal would be a delay pedal, just because there's so many different ways you can use uh, delay to your advantage. I'll just go through a few of them here. Um, you know, delay can be used in a real subtle way. It's kind of a slap echo. Or you can barely tell that it's there, but it's just a bit of slap echo can add some fatness to a rhythm track. Uh, that can be a cool thing. Can use delay in more of a washy type way, where it's more, you know, again, what I was doing with the volume pedal for swells, more of ambient tones. You can kind of hear the washy delays in there. Or just totally clean, so you can hear that even better here. So you can hear all that washy delay, just adding space around the notes. Um, just a cool texture addition there. But delay can also be used in a really rhythmic way. Um, you know, the edge from U2 has kind of shown us the way in this regard. Uh, but using delay where it's actually filling in some notes that you're not playing. So stuff like this. Like a dotted eighth note delay, you know, we got. If 
for some of those more uh, aggressive delay type effects. Great for that. And then this one also has, this, this is worth mentioning, a lot of these digital delay pedals. This is the Boss DD20, but a lot of these have a uh, loop sampler on them, which I think is invaluable just for your practice time, unless you have a buddy who can play G, C, and D for you over and over to practice your soloing or coming up with parts. Just having a little loop sampler here that you can play in, you know. <coughs> I can just sample in a little phrase. So practice little solo lines over. Um, great tool for that too. So really a pretty inexpensive pedal and um, can be used in a lot of ways. Um, so that's my pedal board setup. Uh, again, I use analog pedals with an amp, but there are a lot of ways to go with this, especially if you're in a church, um, a smaller church. Like my church is uh, smaller in size. The auditorium seats about 400 people. Uh, so I mentioned a bit with the rest of the band that you know a lot of times we have too much amp for the stage size that we're on. So I would say if you are going to use a tube amp to make sure that you're, again, not beaming anyone in the face with it, no one else in the band and not the congregation, but try to either turn it around and aim it towards the back. And oftentimes, just getting a lower wattage amp can really help to keep the stage volume down. Um, but these pedals are made to interact with a tube amp. They're analog pedals. Uh, it's the way I prefer to go. There are some great, um, some digital units that when they first came out were pretty, pretty rough sound-wise, but have come a long ways. The, there's some different multi-effects pedals that have come out that are, um, you know, really come a long ways in the sounds. You can uh, get all, a lot of these sounds in one box and go direct out to a house sound system, and then just get back what you need in your monitor. So that can be a good option, uh, cost-effective option, as well as keeping, if you need to really keep your stage volume down, maybe you have a choir or an orchestra on stage, that can be a really uh, viable way to go with your effects. And, um, and the sound quality, again, has come a long ways since they first started doing that. Um, another thing I would talk about with, uh, along with the gear, just that's important to be an electric guitar player, I would say, is coming up with creative parts that fit the song. Um, you know, it's easy for us as guitar players as we're practicing, working on a lot of blues licks and different scale stuff. Uh, it's sometimes easy for us to just get in the world of either I'm playing chords or I'm soloing. And I find so much of the, the, um, the cool stuff that I actually, as I actually listened to albums and I was, as I was learning parts on CDs, it's like, and a lot of stuff is actually in between chords and all out soloing. And so I feel like that's something to, um, you know, just make a note of as you're working on constructing a part for a song, Paul and I will often be together as we're working on one of his songs. And he'll be playing kind of the acoustic rhythm part, you know. Um. Kind of the fundamental uh, rhythm part there. And just thinking of coming up with a little. You know, oftentimes a different voicing, maybe trying to do something a little bit different rhythmically with my right hand. Uh, another example of that would be his song, What Can I Do? primary acoustic part, what Paul will be playing. So I'm going to go to a different spot on the neck. just that part by itself, instead of playing strumming chords, I'm thinking, okay, I can fit it differently by playing a little ar picking an arpeggio. So... Okay, 
way. So differently with the right hand, a different spot on the neck, and not so much changing chord, you know, chord change every time he's changing a chord change. This is something that um, if music theory is not totally familiar to you, maybe checking out the Music Theory Made Easy DVD. Paul breaks it down in some really understandable terms. But looking at playing some common tones where I'm just changing one or two notes over the top, that kind of suspend over the chord changes that are going on underneath. And this is great, electric guitar and also like B3 organ and keyboard stuff is great for kind of adding some of the glue over the top. You know, if everyone's playing, you know, we see a chart and it's G chord, C chord, D chord, and we're all changing the chords exactly on the beat, the music can start to sound really robotic and mechanical. So if a few instruments, like the acoustic guitar or the primary, if maybe if you have a piano player who's playing the main rhythmic instrument, is playing those solid chord changes, you can kind of float around and do stuff that's a little more uh, with common tones as opposed to just changing the whole chord. So that's kind of the idea with that. Again, just totally as an example, no scientific formula for coming up with parts, but I'm always trying to listen to the vocal. First of all, as Paul's playing me a new song, we're, we're going, okay, how can we shape this song and kind of come up with some interesting parts? I want to, first of all, just sit back and listen to the song. You know, I think it's easy for us when we get the guitar in our hands to really like just go into noodle mode and go through our pentatonic scales. And, you know, but but I, I'd encourage you to step back first thing as you're hearing a new song or maybe a song you've, you've heard a bunch of times but you, we want to come up with some new parts for. Step back, uh, just listen to the mood of the song, the vibe of the song, what the song's saying, the lyric, the melody. Take it in for a couple times through, and then, then strap on the guitar and go, okay, what's a, a part that I could add that would complement the rest of what the band is doing or the rest of what the song's saying? And um, so that'll take some trial and error, you know, again, listening to the vocal and going, okay, as I'm moving these couple notes around, is it fighting with the main melody? I don't want to fight with that. But if you're doing just a little bit of movement to support it, it can add nice colors and sounds that wouldn't, you know, that would be missing if it was just chord changes. So not all out blazing soloing. There's a place for that. I love, you know, occasionally there'll be a guitar solo in a song and it's great for us to practice, work on all our scales so that we can, you know, put those to use in a solo. But a lot of the times in our Sunday morning services, we're looking at, uh, you know, playing a little part that will just, with the effects we use, add a nice little color and a different um, aspect to the band that just, you know, hopefully makes the whole better. And I think everyone in the band is trying to do that. Jared on keyboards and you know, Carl and these guys, I, I, everyone's trying to, to add their part as opposed to playing on top of each other. And I think that's one thing that can take your team from, you know, just an average worship band to a, an, the next level of musicianship where you're really complimenting each other and not competing. So, um, yeah, have fun, man, enjoy it. Um, you know, work hard. Paul always has a scripture, you know, in Psalms where it says, play skillfully to the Lord. And I think it's us being good stewards of the gifts that God's given us to really work hard in the practice room. You know, part of that for us electric guitarists is trying out a lot of different pedals and effects so we can get different sounds going. Um, you know, that's, that's one of our big roles. Something that's really important when you're looking at building your effects pedal setup is to go slow with it. I always tell guys, you know, find a guitar, first of all, just without any effects on, no delays, no overdrives. Find a guitar that just by itself, direct, plug, plug directly into an amp, that setup alone, if that inspires you to play, if that's sounding good by itself, then adding effects will just accentuate the sound. But, but a lot of times, if a guy have an amp, uh, has an amp and uh, a guitar that's not necessarily sounding great off the bat, a lot of times you try to cover that up too much with adding chorus and delay and layers of overdrive and all this stuff. And it's really better to start with the fundamentals of a great guitar, great amp. doesn't mean you have to spend a fortune. Um, you know, some pedals that I have hurt a little bit, they cost a little money to save up for, uh, some guitars the same way. Some guitars that I've got that I love playing were $300 at a pawn shop, you know. Um, so it doesn't mean you have to spend a fortune, but it may mean if you're finding an instrument that you love playing, it does happen to be, you know, a higher price instrument. I, I would encourage you to, you know, make it hurt a little bit, save up for it, because uh, it's going to pay off in the long run. But start slow. Start with a guitar and a great amp that you love playing through and add one effect at a time, I would say. Or if you're using a multi-effects, go slow with how many things you layer in there. A uh, question I get a lot is what order to place the pedals in. And I would say there's just a couple rules that are good to follow. There's a lot of subjective stuff uh, that guys have different opinions about, but there are a couple rules that are important to know about. Um, the main one being having your delays and your time-based effects at the end of your chain, after your overdrives and distortion pedals. There's something about the sound when you plug a delay pedal in before those overdrives, that the delays get really muddy and washy and not in a good way. It gets really, um, so it would take away from the sound of your band, it would just, just muddy up the sound. 
Um, so uh, look at putting your delays and tremolos and things like that last in your chain after your overdrives. And then your wah pedal, uh, I, I like it first in my chain before my overdrives. It does sound different if you place it after the overdrives, but that's a personal preference thing. I would just encourage you to experiment with that. And then also the volume pedal uh, can go a lot of different places as well. I like it at the top of my chain because again, if I'm using an overdrive pedal, I can use it to get all these different shades of overdrive from fairly clean to more overdriven, basically putting my volume knob for my guitar at my foot. But let's say you wanted to have it uh, in your bedroom for practice and you wanted the same level of overdrive and distortion but just at a lower volume, then you'd put it at the end of your chain after your overdrive effects. So just a couple ways you can place these pedals. The main, the main thing to follow is just putting your delay pedals last in your chain.